Hey guys, it's Anthony Bandier here, attorney and senior legal instructor with political law enforcement training for another uh, search and seizure show. Um, we just got done with a webinar. If you, have not, if you have not attended our webinars, please do so. They're a lot of fun. We actually did one that's brand new um, about medical liability and civil commitments and so forth, quite frankly, out of my sandbox. Um, but we did a good job at it. And I had uh, a really uh, helpful person on here. Zach, introduce yourself. Hey, Zach Miller here, uh, legal instructor, Blue to Gold, uh, retired law enforcement officer, uh, coming to you live from Missoula, Montana. Yes. Um, if you know Zach, you know that he is uh, he is definitely uh, one of the leading uh, search and seizure experts in the country. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really just an honor to just work with Zach. So we have Zach, we have John um, Ween, who, uh, you know, who's also just one of our full time instructors who just great. We make a good duo, don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really happy to be with you guys. You guys uh, do it, do it the right way. We do it the right way. And we have a lot of great part-time instructors. In fact, um, it's actually, Hey, so Zachy, if you are able to jump on um, and if you have a camera or if you just want to use your microphone, if you just want to jump on, I would love to have you on here. You, you haven't, um, I know you're busy and, and so forth. So if you, if you're able, let me know, but if not, I know it's like last second, I didn't know you were going to be here tonight. But let me know. Okay, so here's how this works. Okay, I do have uh, I got my iPad here, and I have some questions that people. Yeah, exactly. Matt, what's up, Matt? So, um, so we have some questions, but I would love. Not ah, cool, man. So, you see what Brian says? Yeah, that's that's the kind of friends you want. You want you want the firefighter friends. You know what I mean? Right. So, um, guys, so. If you have a question, we would love to answer your question live right now. All you got to do is say, "Hey, I want to ask a question." You don't need a you don't need a camera. We don't turn cameras on for uh, for our questioners. All you need is a microphone. Okay. You can also call us on the phone if you don't if your microphone does not work on your computer. So for those who have a search and seizure question, any search and seizure question from any state, this is where you ask it. Okay. All you got to do is just say, "Me, I have a question," something like that. In the meantime. Um, I'm going to hit you with some questions. Ready, Zach? It's almost right. like you're in class, you know? All right. So the first question I have for you um, is from a student. Let's see where the student is from. The student is from Minnesota. I'm not sure this is going to matter what state they're from, but they are from Minnesota, from a big, a big uh, department in Minnesota. They said, all right, can you please explain lawful use of deception in law enforcement, specifically during interviews and interrogations? Um, when can you use ruses? When can you lie to them? What's some basic rules here, rules of engagement? That's They don't have a scenario here, but just right. some maybe some good advice about lying to people. Uh, this is a hard one. Uh, you know, it, it, it is hard. It's a little, it's a little open-ended. It's a little open-ended. Yeah. At the end of the day, it can't, it can't coerce the person into, into confessing or incriminating themselves. Um, I mean, lying is certainly um, accepted. In, in common. Interrogation <laughs> tactic. It's common. Yeah. But um Yep. Yep. Off the cuff, it's kind of hard to think of a, a specific example. I mean, I, I mean, we can tell, now, you know, well, okay. we can tell people that you know, hey, your buddy is over in the room next door, you know, pointing the finger at you when when he's not over there. Um, I've seen. Okay, that's cases, very common. Yep, I've seen um, cases where where the courts have upheld um, officers had a witness like a like a transcribed witness statement, um, and then the officer before he presented the statement to the suspect, he actually went and altered the statement himself to make some, some things in the statement that he didn't actually say that incriminated the suspect and the court in that case upheld that. I think, I don't know. I think that might be a little. That was kind of stretching it. Like, yeah. you know, falsifying evidence. Yeah. Um, here is, here is basically what I teach. And you tell me if you like this kind of guidelines, I basically say, you can lie about those things which are not, which are uncertain. In other words, that may be debatable. Like, so for example, you know, your, you know, you things that can be disproven, I guess. So you, you got like, you got this, um, this, this fellow associate and like, Hey, your buddy just ratted you out. Well, that's, you know, you know, maybe the buddy didn't rat you out. You know what I mean? Maybe there's like the person like, yeah, I guess you could be lying to me, but I don't, I don't lie about things which are which are based on science. And I, the example that I use is DNA. Um, you should not, my record, I know there's a case on this and I forget what it is, but 
the cop lied to the person says, you know, your DNA was found in the crime scene. And the courts found that that was coercive because a, a reasonable person would know that if the, the DNA is like almost like foolproof, if the DNA is there, you committed the crime, right? How can you explain that? Um, I, so I don't have, a, I don't have an analogy of how I explain this, but that's you know, like the friend line. Um, but I've also seen, but here's the problem. Also, I've also seen uh, cases talking about fingerprints. Can you explain why your fingerprint we found on the gun? And courts are, but they okay. upheld that. Things, yeah. They were okay with that. So I don't know. I just, you know, really at the end of the day, it's coercion, right? It's, it's that right. has, th did this lie overbear, you know, their free will, you know, and, and man. And Jason makes, Jason mentions shocks the conscience. And that was, and to some degree, I guess that still is the standard. So it's a 14th amendment question. It is, you know, uh, it mm -hmm. is open. Are we violating this person's it is, yeah. rights by by inducing him to coerce, uh, by by coercing him to co incriminate himself? Uh, and and a lot of times, particularly in older cases, the standard court the courts use was did the officer's conduct shock the conscience? Was it so outrageous? Yeah. Uh, that that a civilized society would not accept that kind of behavior. Um, it, yeah. it, it, you can get away with quite a bit of lying in a, in an interrogation. You can. Yeah. Can I just tell you, uh, this is just a, a pet peeve of mine. I don't know. I don't know why I'm bothered by it. Maybe you're you, you're not bothered at all by it, but I'm just saying, I don't like the fact that the the FBI will admonish you and say, if you lie to us during our investigation, we're going to hit you with a felony, right? But yet they can lie to you. Yeah. And I know like Forrest is making some comments too about, you know, some of this stuff, but I just, I feel it's fundamentally wrong. Am I am I wrong on this? I mean, I, maybe I'm just getting soft. Maybe I'm maybe I'm a hug a thug. Maybe maybe what happened to me? But I just think it's wrong that when they tell you, "Hey, if you lie to us, we're going to hit you with a felony and potentially send you to prison." But if we lie to you, we can do it. What do you think about that? Yeah, do you have any thoughts do, on that? When we do it, it's good police work. Uh, when you do it, it's a, a felonious yeah. matter. Yeah, and and I I, I agree. I I don't know of a lot of of states that criminalize just straight lying to a police officer. I know in Virginia it's not a crime in and of itself to lie to an officer. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm well, what about what about obstruction? Sean Sean has been back on this. What about you know hindering an investigation or something like that? Yeah, so if the lie you know sends the police down a like a a false path, like it directs the attention away from uh, the investigation, it it uses police resources to investigate something that that was clearly um false and that that could be obstruction of justice well, but just simply i, I agree yeah you know um, but what about I, I what about me FBI, saying you know i wasn't there uh when that event occurred uh when i when i in fact was that's that's a crime well what if i say i was there but my friend did it but i actually did it under under the fbi you're gonna go I'm investigate my friends okay. that's yeah that's that's a crime right i mean no I, what about under what do, you, what do you think about under state laws like obstruction uh, you think that should be well, I don't know if that's well. I mean, I guess it could be. My friend did it, so investigate yeah. him, um, and then we spend time well, investigating him. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you if 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 I was in charge, um, if I was the prosecutor, um, I even even the you know chasing uh, dumb leads. I think if you're lying to them, they you know if we can lie to them, they can they can lie to us. If you want to talk to them. And they're they're you're willing to take that risk that you know chasing butterflies. I, I just think that's the rules of engagement. Um, and if we don't like it, then we don't talk to them. You know, but of course, lying about your name, lying about you know stuff like that could be different. Okay, yep. Okay, so um, I'm getting soft, Zach. I don't know what happened to me, man. No, I, I okay. think I agree. I don't. I think I agree with you. On that. <laughs> I've real, never really given a lot a lot of thought, but I, I think I do agree with that. Well, I, well, I've seen just, and what bothers me though is I've seen a lot of people get jammed up on that lying thing, um, and it's and like they don't get jammed up on anything else though, Zach. Just so you, like that's what I hate about it too. They get jammed. Up, I mean, look, Martha Stewart. I'm not. I'm no fan of Martha. I don't buy her towels. At you know, right. but she got hit with lying, but nothing else to my knowledge. All she she went to prison for lying right. during an investigation. I just think that's such BS. I mean, there's there's other people like be taking that bed in prison besides Martha Stewart. You know, and her, you know, whatever her thing is. Okay. Um, so here's a question from Arizona. Okay. It has to do with um, rear using consensual counters and using rear deck, rear deck lights. So I was watching episode 569 
whatever that one is, where you talk about the full light bar equates to a seizure. Okay. So the idea is that when you, I didn't say it equates a seizure, that it can be, it can be viewed as a seizure. A show, well, a show of authority, I should say, right? Right. When you're, when you're, when you're parking next to somebody that you want to talk to and you put all your lights on and that person sees you get out of the car, would a reasonable person believe they're not free to leave potentially? The answer is yes. Now we should do something proactive to fix that, right? Right. Okay. So if the officer, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I'm saying that you better address it. You better fix it. But you say, hey, just so you know, I'm turning my lights on just because I'm parking in the street. If the officer is wanting to make an essential counter on a pedestrian, park stopped, and the and they only use the rear deck, de de rear, rear deck lights to alert traffic of their stopped vehicle, would it still be considered a seizure or a show of authority? Um, even though no red and blue lights are fa forward facing, what's your advice here for this, these cops? So, so the the flashing lights are not facing the person in question. No, yeah. but let's say the lights are bouncing off the walls and stuff like that. So, like, it's, it's, let's say it's, it's at night. The, the guy, the cop is parked in the you know the, uh, the the shoulder, and he says, you know, and the lights are bouncing off the the you know the the, the buildings around. I think? think it still can certainly be a factor in determining whether a reasonable person would think they're not free to leave. But I think it's much. Um, much less of a factor than if the full uh, array of lights are on. Um, but, you know, I, I think yep. regardless of whether the front lights on, back lights, all of them, I think you should, if, if we're trying to treat this as a consensual encounter, I think an explanation, a quick explanation to the person, hey, just, you know, my car is parked in the middle of the road. The reason my lights are on, in case you're curious, is, is I, you know, I don't want somebody running into to you and I while we're talking here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I, I saw Sean just said something. I'm like, I'm like, he, before he even said, Mike, I'm like, get your ass on this because now we got to talk to you. He just made a statement that I want to dive into a little bit. All right. Can you hear me? Loud yes. and clear, my friend. Now, how are we doing? What oh. are you talking about? We use, we, we use the lights and have All no right, so issues. How dare you? Out, <laughs> out of the rural area, say we've got a suspicious suspect and they're walking and we don't really have anything other than a consensual counter that we have to do. We'll turn our lights on and okay. we articulate to the fact that the lights are for road safety issues, not for seizure. And we tell not we articulate that in the report, but we also tell this the person that we're going out with, hey, right away, you're you're not seized. You're hey, I'm just turning the lights on for traffic safety because we're out here in the dark. And that's what we Okay, Sean. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. Go ahead. That's what you want. Yeah. No, that's that's the reason why we use the front and the back lights and don't have an issue with this. And see, this is so when you made the statements, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time because I because you're my buddy over here. You said uh, we use lights and have no issues. What you really meant to say is when we use lights, we do these other things to make sure that we have no issues. Absolutely. Because that's, yeah, that's too much to type. That's why I just was, went to Mike. Is, <laughs> that's why you're like, get this mic on because because lights are issues right now. I mean, you know, I'm a reasonable person. I'm very comfortable around law enforcement. But if I saw you, you know, park your F-150 with the lights on it, you know, and put your lights on and come up to me and try to talk to me, I would not feel free to leave. And I'm a pretty rational person. But if you said, hey, um, can I just, you know, you're not in trouble. Can I just talk to you for a second? Then I would feel free to leave. Yeah. And then right, that's exactly. what we, make, we make sure that yeah. we tell all our officers, hey, you got to do this right away. If it's a consensual encounter, you're not doing a seizure. Yeah. Just tell them. And what I, and what I do, I know Zach does, but what I do is I use, I love this phrase. You are not in trouble. Hey, can I talk to you? You're not in trouble. I don't say you're free to leave because a lot of people are like, well, in that case, I'm just going to leave. I just say, hey, look, you're not in trouble. I, I just, and I, you know, hey, let's put my lights on just so people know where I'm at or something like that. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, I like it. I agree 100% with everything Sean just said. Um, nothing wrong with using the lights for safety reasons. I think it's a good, <laughs> a good idea. But, you know, a quick explanation yeah. to the person, I agree 100%. Now, I do have a case um, where the guy, the cop, you know, saw this car in a parking lot late at night, suspicious, not reasonable suspicion, but suspicious. And I wanted to contact him. He did put his rears on because, you know, part of it was um, he wants his partners to know where he's at, right? Because it's kind of hard to define exactly where you're at in a parking lot. Okay. Um, and he did, he did not tell the, you know, he did not explain to the person why he put the lights on, but the court did say that there was no evidence that the person was aware that the rear lights were on and that's fine. But I would have loved the cop to be like, just, just explain, Hey, I'm just putting my lights on for safety. So people know where I'm at, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's, a, so that's a case that seems to endorse it, not needing it, but they did say that the guy didn't, he didn't talk about how he saw the lights. So the yeah, court basically assumed that he did not know about the lights. 
for a seizure to occur, the person obviously has to be aware of the the show of authority. But but you don't know, you know. It, it, That's you right. Don't know how this thing's going to play out. So yeah, just explain it to them and move on. Cool. Sean, do you have anything else? No, that's good. Thank you. Good job, man. Thank you. All right. Um, if anybody else has any questions, that's how it works. You just we just turn your mic on. You ask a question. Bada bing, bada boom. All right, Kenneth. Kenneth. What up, Kenneth? Hey, how you guys doing? doing good. good, buddy. What state are you in? Uh, California, unfortunately. Okay, good. No, well, fortunately, unfortunately, what 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 part of California? Uh, Southern California. Yeah, look, at least you have nice weather. You know, what I mean, even though you live under a dictatorship, at least you have uh, the weather's nice when you go out in the yard. Yeah, sure, <laughs> take that. Yeah, <laughs> yep. What you got? Um, so quick question. Um, you run a vehicle. Uh, vehicle comes back. Uh, with possibly involved in a ADW, bring the guy back at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. Start start questioning him, but the 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 ADW was possibly involved in was in another city. Um, so when you bring the guy out and you put him on the curb, would you recommend Mirandizing if you're just trying to figure out get to the bottom of what what actually transpired or why why his vehicle is on a basically ADW list for another agency? Yeah, um, Zach. Well, first of all, before Zach answers, just how long? How old is this 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 like this this incident um this like, like, it, happened, it happened this year yeah how long did but no, i'm saying though no. how long ago did they did the solid deadly weapon happen before um, the, before the, was, the, 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 was, the traffic stop it was put in the system probably like three weeks to a month prior to the stop <laughs> right okay so i just want to bring I, I want to talk about that too if you don't mind but uh zach what do you think well, so, I mean, the Miranda question, you got to have both elements. You've got to have the person in custody and you have to be interrogating the person. So uh, interrogating them is interrogation is just for layman's purposes, asking guilt seeking questions. Right. Uh, custody is under arrest or uh, being subjected to arrest like measures. So, you know, the, the custody part, you know, how did we get him out of the car? Did we get him out at gunpoint? Is he handcuffed? You know, how many officers are on scene? Particularly, so, how many officers are, are nearby while he's being questioned? These are all things we would need to know the answer to to determine if he's in custody. First of all, right. So and my then, perspective, I always yeah. thought, okay, just because you put him in cuffs, um, the cuffs can easily come off, doesn't it? But you put the cuffs on because you don't really know, you don't have all the facts, so to speak. Right. So you're trying so to get right. to the bottom of what you know. It's in the system, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the person driving the vehicle is the one that was involved in the ADW, so to speak. Sure. So, and, and if we're if so, Miranda is only going to protect him if we so if we violate the Miranda rule and he incriminates himself, Miranda is going to protect him from from using those statements in court. And I, I I get what you're saying. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but so custody, are we using arrest like measures? And handcuffs are are one of the quintessential arrest like measures. People normally associate someone in handcuffs with someone being arrested but but it's not automatic so just because you're in handcuffs doesn't necessarily automatically mean you're in custody i'm just saying it's a strong custody factor so if we've got this guy in handcuffs because we're investigating a dangerous crime so it's for our safety and his safety um let him know that ahead of time say hey man listen i'm gonna ask you some questions but first of all i want you to understand you're not under arrest Do you understand that yes uh, and the reason, in case you're curious, the reason you're in handcuffs is not because you're under arrest, because we we have some concerns about our safety, given the, the, the nature of the offense we're investigating. So the handcuffs are for safety. They're not for uh, the fact that you're under arrest. And, okay. and that takes the arrest-like feel out of the handcuffs. Um, so if all else does, you kind of fall oh, back on, what is it, Bueller? Behaler. Uh, California versus Behaler, Behaler is, uh, Behaler, however, however you want to say it, is one of the cases. Yeah, I like to say Behaler over there, but yeah. Yeah, talked about yeah. what it means to be in custody. Okay, but it's a totality so, of circumstances. Here, here, did, we, did we use force on the guy? How many guys are? How many officers are present? Is he in handcuffs? That's those are the questions we need answered. So, so a, a couple a couple things, uh, Ken, if I may. Number one, I think the first question that the court would just want to know is the why, right? Just like Zach said, if we don't have a good reason for putting the, hand, the, the handcuffs on, I think that we're already probably going to be arrested like custody. That's the, first, the, the 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 fourth one is all about reasonableness, right? Um, well, and this is this is a an interrogation issue and so forth. But 
And so it's about reasonable. And do we have a reason to put the handcuffs on? If you get past that, the next thing is, you know, is there a rest like custody? So it's how these circumstances, the fact that the guy's on the curb actually sends the message that he's not going to jail because curbs kind of in- indicate, Hey, let's just figure out what people, you know, especially in California, people are put on curbs all the time during investigations. Um, and you're probably explaining to him, Hey, you know, your, your tag came back to a, you know, assault with a deadly weapon. He now knows you're investigating something. He's not under arrest. And the behealer admonishment is very common in California, as you know, to tell the guy in no uncertain terms, just so you know, you're not under arrest. You're just being detained. We're just trying to figure out things, what's going on. Um, there have been, I just want to say a few more things if you don't mind. There's been, you know, thousands of times cops around this country will go to a domestic violence investigation, put a person in cuffs because they feel that there's a safe, a rational safety issue ask them about what happened, they admit to beating their spouse and they're not considered in custody. But my experience has been that A, cops don't really understand these rules and they go to court or, they, or they're telling, when they become bosses with stripes and stars and bars, they start telling others that cuffs mean custody, which is not correct, just like Zach said. And I feel like prosecutors are part of the problem because they keep telling people during academies that, you know, you better start, you know, when people are not free to leave, they love the, 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 when they're not free to leave, you got to have Miranda. And it's A, that's not the rule, clearly. And B, I feel like they're just being a little, they just want, they don't want to deal with these Miranda issues in court. So they just want cops to read it. So they don't have to have a, an argument that they don't, they want to avoid the argument. Does that make sense? So I kind of get upset that prosecutors wouldn't be a little bit more willing to, you know, just be like, no, custody is a pretty high burden to relatively. And that this is not custody. Right. That, that that was my perspective. I was just wondering because it's like if you read the Miranda and he refuses to talk, I mean, you can't do anything. So now you're done. Yeah. Um, one more thing, too, it's, it's, since we're on the topic. If he's not in custody and you read him Miranda anyway and he, he refuses to answer questions, you can still question him because you're not violating right. his Miranda rights. You That's can't it. make him answer questions, though. Right. Um, but no, if a prosecutor. But, but has the other thing, too, is Miranda is everybody we ask questions to. They, they want they, that's what they want. They, the, the prosecutors want they want look, they want search warrants for everything. They want Miranda for everything because, you know, sometimes they're lazy and they just don't want to do the They don't want to jump to these hurdles in suppression hearings. And I understand that. But at the same time, you know, our cops are losing confessions. But here's the other thing. Here's here's what I would teach. OK, if, if I was the prosecutor or whatever, I would say if you're debating and like they're like, yeah, man, it can go either way. Why don't you go with Miranda? Go the non Miranda route, because. A, you probably are correct. I think it's a little, you know, we, we already talked about that. And B, you're not violating a base rights. Even if even if the court, as long as we don't use those that testimony in the case in chief, you know, we don't bring it up first, then no rights are violated at all. What's the what's the Supreme Court case on that? T- t- topic or something? The one that just happened last year where oh, the Supreme oh, Court uh, says that. Vega you, versus Tico, yeah. Vega versus Vega, Tico. yeah, yeah. So as long as as long as we don't use and so there's no no rights are being violated anyway. If we don't use them in the case in chief, which means against them, but they come up and lie and like, well, you told us the opposite. We can impeach them with it. So that's another issue that if we're just like this, I say just lean towards not reading it, but I'm also not your prosecutor. And if the prosecutor heard me saying that, they would probably not agree with me because they don't want that mindset. But anyway, that's just another point. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're, you're welcome, brother. Uh, who else? I'm just going. Yeah, they don't. Okay, so uh, David, can you, uh, David, will you come on the show because we don't really want to ask. You know, we want to like have engagement on here. Can you just uh, put your mic on and ask that question? And while you're considering, let me just ask Zach a real quick question. But we want to get people on the show. Zach, I got a question from uh, Texas. Okay, he says the the, uh, the cop says, you know, so in Texas, officers cannot make a warrantless arrest for misdemeanors that occurred outside the presence of an officer, except for one specifically listed in the code of criminal procedure, such as breach of the peace, um, protective orders, and so forth. All right, for for example, let's just use some misdemeanor that is not one of those ones. Like let's say shoplifting. Okay, the officers show up. They view security footage, which shows the suspect doing some offense. Again, shoplifting. Uh, five minutes before they arrive. Can we, and then then they find the suspect down the street. Can they arrest that suspect for the misdemeanor? We, we've had, I think we had a question similar to this um, 
few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, right. so, I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. So the presence requirement, you know, and I always use the analogy, you know, I, I watched the, uh, one of the planes crash into the twin towers on television. It did not occur in yep. my presence. Okay. Um, I yep. was in Ohio when that happened. So watching video footage of an offense occur, a recorded footage of an offense occur is not occurring in your presence. So um, I'm inclined to say no, that now, doesn't meet the presence requirement. 100% agree. Can't, 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 can't agree more. I, I, I know that that's not in your presence, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Just like you said, and by the way, I did steal that analogy. So I love the, the 9-11 analogy. Right. So, but we did kind of talk about you know, um, actually, I, I, we have the answer, by the way. It's not, you, you just can't arrest them, but you can cite them. That's that's what you do in this case. There, these laws, generally speaking, do not prohibit a citation not coming in your presence. It's the arrest. So would you agree with that, Zach? For the most part, most laws would allow a citation. Just, I mean. Uh, it depends on the state. Uh, Virginia, it has to occur in your presence yep. to cite them as well. Um, okay. In a lot of states, no, you can cite in lieu of arresting. Um and I don't know. That yeah. Don't... So in, in a, a citation is not an arrest constitutionally. OK. And under most state laws, Virginia seems to be a little different. But I know in Nevada and in California, um, you know, they have they have that rule. You can certainly cite them. You just can't arrest them. Mm -hmm. So you, you you stop them. You identify them and so forth. Um, Amanda says, what about searching them for their evidence? Let's say that they were shoplifting. They put you, you saw them put stuff in their bag. OK. It's all recorded. You know, loss prevention did not say with their own eyes, so they can't do a citizen's arrest, which would make it kind of easy. Mm -hmm. So we find them down the street. We cite them. Can we recover the stolen merchandise out of their uh, bag? If you've got probable cause, well, first of all, if you have probable cause to believe they currently have it in their possession, um, then, yep. then you can detain them and search them. And if they have it in their possession, they're still committing the offense of larceny in your presence. Because larceny is a larceny is a continuing offense. It it continues until mm, return. Got a little twist on there. Yeah. So then you can make a custodial arrest because it is in your presence. Mm. So. Okay. And what what's the recognized exception that got you into their bag in the first place? Uh, I'd argue exigent circumstances. The need to search now versus yeah. leaving to get a warrant uh, would be the easiest. Yeah. One. Yeah. Okay, I agree. And even if those you know there's a lot there's still a lot of um, in in Nevada that's we couldn't. We couldn't do that arrest anyway, um, because they changed the law that minor offenses, um, even if they did commit work in your presence, um, they don't want them going to jail. They want them sign release unless they can't identify themselves. They are going to repeat the offense. You get my point. Yeah. So we, we would still have to release them, but it wouldn't be a search instant to arrest. It would be an exigent circumstances search that's focused on recovering the evidence and then letting the person go. Mm -hmm. If you're going to let them go, if you're going to let them go. Um, can I ask you, so that question, by the way, are we, um, David, uh, uh, can you get on the mic? Dave, you have said, I think you have a good question here. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe just a simple question we can answer, but I'd love to get, get people on the mic. Um, but one, one thing, uh, Zach, I, I did want to ask you with going back to that California case, mm -hmm. um, it was Kenneth, right? Yeah. Are you good with just, did you have any concerns about the stop occurring a month later? Yeah. <laughs> I thought we were going to get to Could that. It, I mean, it doesn't sound, yeah. I forgot, I forgot to bring it up, but I know that we have a, we have a staleness doctrine for misdemeanors that not all states really have the, you know, the stale misdemeanor doctrine. Hmm. Um, do you, have you heard about that? That stale misdemeanor that they do in, they have in California? Um, I've so I there's the, Ninth Circuit case law that talks about cl completed misdemeanors and whether a person can be detained for those. Is that are we talking about the same thing? Yeah, that's something? that's probably related. But they they call it the stale misdemeanor doctrine, and basically, yeah, that's I think it's the same factor. Basically, if the misdemeanor was you know it happened in prison, but you just you just you just basically sit on it, you know, you just don't you don't take you don't take care of business. You know, we're not talking about seeing a person speeding, but waiting waiting for a backup unit. We're talking about seeing a person speeding, for example, and then stopping the, the next day for it. That would be a stale misdemeanor in California does not allow it. Now, the stale misdemeanor doctrine is not really uh, allegedly like rooted in common law or they just don't, not all states recognize it, but it's just, it's a, it's a California thing. I, I don't know, you know, that's, there's no stale felony, but 
I would first ask if you if you even had PC. If you had PC, I guess you have a the statute of limitations, right? I mean, you can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, you want to be silly about it, but if you if you only have reasonable suspicion, I think that there's an argument that this investigation becomes stale. I don't know. I just I don't see a lot of cases like that, but I I don't think it's automatic. Yeah. If that was the only reason for the stop, I I think there's some some Fourth Amendment issues with that. This. Yeah, I do. I, I absolutely. It's like, it's like a, a, you what you have of what, interest. It's you know I don't know. Yeah, I I agree. I think at some point it's going to become unreasonable, but we would have to do some some research on it. Okay. Um, oh, here's another California case. Let's see. This one is. Uh, do you know what a Ramey warrant is? A who warrant? A Ramey. Uh no. Not so Ramey. Oh, David, you can't do your mic unless I do it. So hold on one second. Let me get, hold on. Let me, let me turn it on my end. Hold on, David. Okay. Go ahead, David. You should see it on your end. Okay. Can you hear me, sir? Yep. What state are you from? Oh, you're, you said South uh, Car North Carolina? No, South, South Carolina. Carolina. Yes, sir. Okay. So South Carolina just passed last week a new law uh, regarding constitutional carry. Uh, um. Retired law enforcement working for EMS right now, and one of the big concerns for EMS right now is that you're no longer able, you, you no longer have to tell law enforcement that you're carrying a firearm and so forth. So often we're called out by law enforcement to transport somebody for, to the hospital for whatever said reason, and now the concern is where does... Where do we stand with the search? You know, somebody doesn't tell law enforcement that they have a firearm. However, in the state of South Carolina, it is illegal to take one into the hospital. So at what point mm. are we able to engage law enforcement? Uh, is it considered a Terry Pat? Because basically they will be a, uh, committing a crime, taking it into a hospital and so forth, or putting them in an ambulance. What's, and w w where is that safety right. pad? Is it a Terry Pat? Where do we stand on that? Well, can I ask you one question? Are you private or public ambulance? Public ambulance. We're a county third party uh, service. You're third party, but you're you're an agent of the state. Is that right? We have that straight. That is correct. Yes, a county government. Yes, we cover the whole county for 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 the. Uh, oh, I see. I see. So, okay. What's your what, what's your well, feedback, Zach? Well, pat downs are not for illegal weapons. They're for weapons. So the. The lawfulness of the carrying of the firearm is not relevant for Terry, true Terry purposes. You know, we're we're patting someone down because we forcibly stopped someone. And we have a suspicion they could be armed, uh, which could constitute a threat. So this is different yeah. than that. the fact that he could be committing a crime by taking it into the hospital. I don't think is relevant at all to the Frisk Authority. Um, now, if we have, if the officer or the medics have some kind of concern that this person is some kind of threat uh, to the officer than, or to the, to the medics while inside the confined uh, area of the ambulance. I, I think a, a protective search, I think, could be justified with some kind of articulation as to why we think this guy's a concern. But if we're just checking him because we don't want him committing a crime by taking a weapon into the hospital, I don't see where the legal... No, we're not, we're not, we're not. Yeah, it's also probably illegal to have drugs on you. So, um you know, there might be illegal to have other things in the hospital. So, yeah, you would have to have a reason to believe he's armed and dangerous. Yeah. Right. And then we can, you know, search his bag and so forth. Is that, you know, I, if you don't have that initial threshold, I don't know why the government would be going through this guy's bag just because he's getting medical treatment. Yeah, no, it's more of a concern of a safety concern for the crews that are on the ambulance and so forth. So if you have somebody that's intoxicated, so they're not really in danger mm -hmm. But they're too intoxicated to, you know, we're talking about, you know, competency and capacity and so forth. So they don't meet that requirement sure. to be able to be left someplace. So they have to go someplace. Unfortunately, here, our jail okay. system won't take public intox. They always have to go to the hospital, get cleared and right. so forth. So we're we're constantly called for public intox, you know, take them to the hospital, let them sleep it off there and kind of go from there. And that's where, you know, we're trying to draw up a policy, for lack of better words. We've talked to several, you know, we have, I believe, 11 different uh, law enforcement jurisdictions that we work with. So depending on what yep. city, what county, you know, who we're dealing with, everybody's giving us a deep, different feedback on whether they will do it, whether they won't do it. And then 
if we find a firearm, who's going to take custody of it? You know, we can't put it on the ambulance. Right. My people aren't trained, you know, to deal with firearms and, and you know, and so forth. So now yep, who takes yep, possession yep. of this and so forth? And that's what the concern is. And that's, you know, where we go next from there. Well, they, 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 I would say that though, didn't, didn't we have this concern before the law changed? I mean, wasn't it still illegal prior to constitutional carry to bring a firearm into, firearm into a hospital? Yes, it was. It's always been, and, and that hasn't changed at all whatsoever. Yeah. It, it's more the concern is, you know, the, the fact that more people might do it. And as I said, you know, we're, right. we're just trying to come up with something that meets the law and standards, you know, and kind of go from there. Well, here's 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 my answer. This is what I would say, you know, is that the law, the, the, the Fourth Amendment hasn't changed. So if you, right, or your government or, you know, you're the government or, or any of your you know, uh, EMS providers, they want to go through that man's back. I mean, could, could see, you're probably going to see if there's a gun on his person as he's in the stretcher. That might be a little easy, right? But if you want to open up his bag and just make sure he has no gun, um, I would not advise it. I don't think the law allows that because you are the government and you're searching. You're, that's a search. And you at least need a reason to believe that he has a weapon that can hurt. The we If he has the weapon, that's fine. Just like Zach said, armed equals dangerous in most circumstances. So, but if you don't have that and you're, and you're just doing it just to make sure he has no weapon because you have your constitution carry now i don't think that's going to fly okay thank you very much for your time as i said it's just something new that, that i'm trying yeah. to teach the it's 18 great. year olds out yeah, there it's very, it's very common they can handle now just can I, what can i just throw one more thing you did mention something about um you know you did mention about intoxication if he's if he's being taken because he has no capacity to care for himself i do believe that you can pat down those people because that is basically, you know, it's a civil arrest, right? I mean, you're taking that person off the street against their will, probably. I mean, you know, they're not, they didn't tell you yes or no, right? They're just, you're doing it anyway. Is that, is that, a, and if you're doing that, um, just like a civil commitment, we can at least, we can actually do a full blown search into arrest on civil commitments. But if you're taking people for, to dry out, um, I do believe the law would allow you to do a pat down because you're transporting them and it's a, it's an obligation. It's an obligatory transportation. It's not consensual. To, to a degree. Would you agree with that, Zach? It's a, it's a seizure uh, for Fourth Amendment purposes. And, and it's a seizure. Yeah, it's, exact, it's a seizure. Effect, exactly. Effectively an arrest. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think. That's that, right. That's right. The, that guy, the, the drunk guy. That's right. That's right. The drunk guy is different than the heart attack guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Okay. All right, David. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Yes, it does. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Yeah, thank you, brother. Um. When you guys going to get constitutional? Uh, what if he's unconscious? If is, well, it's 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 not a seizure. It's still not a seizure. If he's unconscious, you probably have implied consent. So it's not a, you're, the government's not taking him against his will. It, you know, it, that's you still in the same boat. It's and if he's unconscious, how is he going to hurt you with the gun? But <laughs> that might be another issue. Right. <laughs> I mean, he if he if he can grab that gun while he's unconscious, you might have misdiagnosed him. He's doing something. all right. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to our Ramey warrants. So Ramey warrants in California are basically um, they're, they're, all they are is arrest warrants. It's a I don't know why they, they call them Ramey. There must be a, a court a Supreme Court case or something called Ramey, but um, but that's just a that's a California thing. So. The question that this officer says is that if we got this Ramey warrant, so if we have an arrest warrant issued by a judge, right, mm -hmm. does that trigger the Sixth Amendment right to counsel? So in other words, can they, you know, can they, um, you know, let's say I have a warrant, okay, a Ramey warrant, arrest warrant, just, just call it an arrest warrant, okay? Right. And you pick me up. Can you give me, can you give me Miranda warnings and try to get a confession? What do you think the answer is? Without violating the Sixth Amendment? Well, does the Sixth Amendment even apply at this point? It applies at your first appearance before a judicial official. So the issuance of or, the, or, or, or indictment by a grand jury. Right. They haven't been indicted either. Right. So right. no, so no, your Sixth Amendment right to counsel hasn't attached yet. Now you once you if you take them before the magistrate for an arraignment or a bond hearing or a commitment to a detention facility, then the Roth Jerry case, what is it? Roth Jerry, um, Gillespie, Roth Jerry versus Gillespie County. Uh, that's that is mm -hmm. the initiation of the adversarial process. So, but no, the yep. issuance of the arrest warrant and then the serving of the arrest warrant is not 
the attachment of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Yep, I agree. All right, let's see I'm if sure we can answer. York. Does anybody have New York? <laughs> Sean, Sean says my room looks small. Look, I even my room's look. I even got like yeah, I even got like you know. You got I mean, this. it's it's a suite. You know, I got a little kitchen in front of me. Come on. What, you, you trying to say that Zach is uh, showing me up over here because he has a nicer room? <laughs> I don't, I don't look, have you think your room, room looks I huge. I don't have the separate bedroom. I have one big room. See, he thinks, see, he thinks that this is, this is my room. This ain't my room. This is just this is the living room. Zach, do you have a living room I don't and have a, a, a separate room. bedroom? Nope. See? No living look, room. look at Zach's. Look at that, look, that look crap that, house that he's that. in. This is, this is that pauper yeah, wage. Yeah, Zach's looks bigger. This is that pauper wage that blue to gold. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm the one that's balling over here. Okay, I said I said upgrade me at the Red Roof Inn. <laughs> um, let's try to answer one more easy one. Hold on, let's see what I got here. That one's kind of complicated. So, ooh, a Nevada one. Let's see. All right. Okay. <laughs> Tom Bodet. I'm feeling, I don't even know who, that's how, I mean, that's I don't even that, know who Tom Bodet is. That's Motel 6. He'll yeah, it will keep the play. lights on for you. I mean, yeah. but who the hell is Tom Bodet? Is he, is he a country cool. singer? Is he, but who, who is, is he an actor? I think he's just the guy, he's just some random guy that was the spokesman for Motel 6. That's old school right there. Oh, so he wasn't like a famous person before? Yeah, so. well, look, if he was an actor, if he was an actor doing a Motel 6 commercials, he was he was a loser. That's what he was. He was an absolute <laughs> loser to get that contract. Right, right. Yeah. All right. No calling names here, elders. All right. So, um, all right. So, look, this question comes from Nevada. Okay, not Nevada, Nevada. Um, my team. Uh, this is from Las Vegas. My team contacted a vehicle parked in a parking lot occupied by a male and female for being in the parking lot after the, the parking lot after hours. So this is going to be a park violation. Okay. 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 So my officer asked the male driver if there was any drugs in the vehicle or if he had a gun specifically, right? Any it's Nevada. It's like South Carolina. People like their guns. The male was, the male said no to the drugs, but did not answer if he had a gun. The male was ordered to exit the vehicle and was given a pat down with no weapons found. So I know you have, I can see your eyes. I can, I can see your, your brain working here. Okay. Yep. The area of the stop is a very high crime area where shootings, stabbings, drug dealings, and robberies are very common. Sounds like my kind of place. A check of the male's criminal history showed price for carrying a concealed weapon without a permit. Based on totality of circumstances, my officer did a frisk of the passenger compartment of the vehicle, including the glove and center counsel for weapons. Um, Cause he was about to be released back to the vehicle. No weapons were found. However, was this okay? So, okay. What do you think? Uh, I'm assuming we knew all of this information before we did any of these frisks. I'm assuming we knew the criminal history. The is that well, we, all fair? we knew, all we knew, according to this, this is that when we put hands on him, okay, we knew that he was in a high crime area in a park after dark with a female occupant and he did not answer the gun question. He answered drugs, but did not answer the gun question. So did that get us a pat down on him? So I know that, that courts, so we need reasonable suspicion to believe he's armed and dangerous. Uh, we, we're, first we have to have yep. a lawful detention and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to assume we do based upon, is, I guess. I think so. Yep. Trespassing or, it's a misdemeanor coming in his presence. So he's, yeah. He's in the park uh, after hours. And yep. as far as, reasonable suspicion to believe someone's armed and dangerous i just of reading i've read hundreds maybe thousands of these cases i think the courts have two levels of reasonable suspicion they have reasonable suspicion to detain someone which is like this much and then the rs mm -hmm. for having a weapon is less like it's less than mm -hmm. the standard of reasonable suspicion. because the consequences because of the consequences. the consequences of being wrong are more significant so i think at that even yeah. the under the lower standard of reasonable suspicion this is probably barely enough, but I, I, I would, I, if I was put on the spot, say, hey, can we pat this guy down on this information? I'd say yes. I agree. I think that the key, though, the key is the way he didn't answer that gun question. Yes. You know, he seems he he. If he was a guy that said, "I ain't answering your questions," I would say no pat down. 
the gun. But because he can answer the drug question. Yep. So, but that's how, that's how thin this is. Yeah. This is super, this is paper thin. Yeah. But I agree, Zach, I would have upheld it too. Um, And look, now, what do you, what do you think about this though? You know, Michigan versus Long and so forth. Do you think that cops should be trained that, hey, if you, like, let's say the court agrees that, you know, the, um, the person can be patted down. It's barely enough. And they are going to be returned to the vehicle with that citation, right? Or warning. What about the car? There's, is that, is that, that is that automatic in a sense? Like you get the person, you get the car? So the same reasonable suspicion that you have for the person, I think, would extend to the vehicle. If I believe he's he's got a weapon, you know, in his possession, uh, I think we could easily, in most cases, use those same factors to extend to the car. But I know there is definitely a split of authority. And I think the majority position is that we can frisk the car on the theory that he could be returning to the car at the end of this interaction or at some point sure. in the interaction. So yeah, of course he's not going to be yeah. in the car when we frisk the car. Um, so what right. I teach officers is as long as at least one person involved with this vehicle is not under arrest. So at least one person is just being detained yep. at the time you are, are going to frisk the car, then I think it's okay. Um, but there are some courts that say, no, if you've removed them from the vehicle, uh, you've removed any threat that the weapon might pose to you that's in the vehicle. Uh, and if the only returning to the And car, they can't get it now type stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. You've, you've eliminated, you've mitigated that threat. And the theory is, well, if they've been released and they're going back to their car to leave, what incentive do they have to turn around and attack you? You know? So, yeah, which is stupid. I mean, I, I get I it, know, but I it's also you. putting a cop in a very, uh, put a, put, making the cop a psychologist, you know? Uh, I think it involves um, hopefully you still... It, it, it does. It's, it's, you know, and, um, so, but yeah, I know I've seen what you're, are you thinking about that New Jersey case? Maybe that's where you think there's a New Jersey case that kind of talks about that idea. Yeah. Yep. So, um, but I think we agree that most states are a little more rational than that because long even talks about being put back, you know, that the, the returning to the vehicle was part of the analysis. Um, here's what I kind of say, look, I, I, I agree. I just, I would like, I say the farther you search front person, their bag, their car, the more factors you should probably have, you know, because it, it just seems more intrusive. It's like, there's something psychologically, you know, look, you're, you're on this, you're, you're the judge. You're like, yeah, he, he went, he pat him down after he couldn't answer the gun question, but now you're tossing the car. And it's like, it was already paper thin, you know, do you have anything else? And I, I think it'll work. I just, I just wish cops had more, you know, yeah. um, you know, in the criminal history, I think, and by the way, the criminal history is what I, what, what I'm talking about here. So I think we're still good. But I do like the fact that, you know, after he patted him down, finds nothing, he's probably in the front of the push bumper, sees more uh, crimes that are gun related. Now that gives us more reason to think he's armed and dangerous. And we we we, we do the car. Yeah. Uh, do you have any? Uh, but look, but I'm not saying that's the rule. It's just something I, I like cops to articulate more than not less. Finally, what do you think about the um, opening up that glove box in the center console? Yeah, I think it's good to go. It's we can search for any place where a weapon could be located and quickly accessed by someone who was in the vehicle. And 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 opening a glove yep. box or a center console was a real quick, you know, lifting or, or pushing a button. So yeah, I don't have any problem with that. What I mean, I mean, yeah. Look, if you put in a glove box and you can't search the glove box, then they then that's where they just put their guns, right? Yeah, right. Or the center console. Then it's 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 immune from you know seizure. Mm -hmm. Um. What about the female's purse? She's the purse is on the floorboard next to her. She's not the one you're really concerned for safety issues, but it's her purse. What do you think about that? So, with if it's if it's an item that is clearly associated with someone else, um, I would like to see a, a little bit more. To, uh, any what's the reason we think that the weapon could be in her purse? You know, what is their associate? Is this boyfriend girlfriend? Or is this just uh, no? Just they're, they're they're not they're not. It's not Uber. They're okay. friends. So so there is some kind of association with them. I think there's oh, there's definitely association. They're not you know. Yeah. yeah I mean, I guess you could be a prostitute or something like that. But you know, but no, they're friends. I, I think I and think the purse that, is the probably, purse is accessible to him. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think the I think it would be subject to a frisk. But when I when it comes to purses, backpacks, and like carried belongings, when it comes to frisking those, I always. Uh, like to tell officers start with the pat down of the exterior of the item and if that yeah, is that's right that's right it's inconclusive like it, right. there's so much stuff in there that like you genuinely cannot conclude one way or another 
whether there's a weapon in there. Yeah. Then I think the next step would be to unzip it and a, and a, a peek inside. And if that is still inconclusive because there's just so much stuff in there, I think it would be reasonable to reach in and, and move things aside to the extent that we can ensure that there's no weapons in there. So I think a, a, fr a frisk of a purse or a backpack needs to be done incrementally uh, yep. using the least intrusive means each step along the way. More intrusive needs yep. uh, needs justification. Well, that's exactly what I teach too. So that's, I mean, the way that's the way I teach it, just incrementally it's almost like peeling the onion you know what i mean because really because you know that can happen with a person too you know we, we do start outside the clothing but there are some people for example homeless people that wear so much clothing that you just cannot safely determine that they're carrying a weapon i just say peeling the, the onion i think the courts will understand that if you know that you just if you can't do it you go to the next layer or the next layer until you until you can actually get the job done otherwise people just wear you know really big coats and the gun is really hidden you know Right. Um, okay, cool. Hey, look, I think this was a, a good show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Zach, thank you so much for, you know, for joining me and so forth. Um, anything, any parting words? Nope. Nope. Uh, good, good, good discussion. We'll, we'll do it again sometime soon. Well, I'll, I'll put some parting words. Guys, go to blue to gold.com. Go look for Zach's classes and take his classes. It's an amazing, amazing instructor. He knows, he knows what he's talking about. Clearly, you saw that on this uh, this search and teaser show. So go take a, a Zach Miller class. You'll be a huge fan. Um, all right, guys. Thank you so much. I'll see you. Well, hopefully we will see you next week. <laughs>